Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning, and uh, we're glad everybody's here. If you're a guest or if you have a prayer request of any time, any kind, time, any kind, just put them on the uh, connection card on the side of your bulletin and drop it off at the back table. We do our best to meet that need. As we begin this morning, uh, I want to uh, say first of all that uh, our new ultraviolet air scrubbers have been installed, so we have an air purification system going on now that that kills uh, germs and such, and Hopefully, you're helping this virus-prone world. It just makes it a little safer place around here. Hopefully, that's the goal. Amen? And uh, so, let you know that's done. Appreciate all those who were involved in that. Also, next Sunday, by the way, we have a baptism. If anyone is interested in baptism, uh, uh, get a hold of me or Pastor Bob, and we'd love to talk about that. Also, we have a thank you card uh, from Wilson uh, School. You know, we adopted Wilson School, and uh, uh, for in-service, uh, Pastor Bob had taken over some lunch, and... Uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, right? I believe it was. And uh, they, all the teachers signed a card. Or just a nice gesture. And it'd be on the bulletin board if you'd like to take a, a look at that. Also, Children's Church start next, starts next week again in October. And so everything uh, seems to be uh, doing fine. So we can do that. So we're grateful to be able to do that. Uh, Wednesday night we have, of course, Wednesday evening service for the adult and youth. Don't forget that. And shoe boxes, we need uh, some help. Uh, Claudia Joe needs some help putting together a school supply kit. So contact Claudia Joe if you'd like to help on Operation Christmas Child. It's getting close uh, for shoebox time, believe it or not. And that's even on our calendar, packing nights and things like that. So uh, keep that in mind and keep bringing uh, stuff in. And uh, again, we'd like to welcome you who are here. like to welcome those online and those in the parking lot as we worship the Lord today. I believe Brother Steve's going to come and he's going to pray as we get started this morning. And we're just going to have a wonderful time. Amen. Brother Steve. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this day. Heavenly Father, God, thank you uh, for your creation. We think of our church family here and what you're doing in this church and light and the path that you uh, lead for us. Uh, the examples that our two pastors, the Allen family, the Vester family, is laying down, leading us in a direction that glorify you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this time. We thank you for the Bible that you put together where we could read it, study it, become more and more like you, get our, our families and, and our love and the grace and mercy comes from you. So we, as we come today, one body, one voice, uh, one spirit, Lord, that you give us, that you bring us together. We want to lift up our prayers, our petitions to you. We have uh, unspoken prayers, Lord, each one of us, our family and friends. We lift them up to you, touch them in a great mighty way. Uh, reveal to them truth. Use us as a church family to get the truth out in a loving way. Uh, we pray for missionaries all over the world. I know we've got uh, Devin and Cherry, Charity, the Slody family, uh, trying to get back on the mission trail. So I want to lift them up to you, uh, a personal note through this church. Uh, touch them and guide and direct them. Help them get to where they need to be to spread the gospel. Uh, missionaries all over the world, Christians all over the world, followers of Jesus all over the world. Uh, that uh, are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Wilson School, use our church to go out there, whether it be the food pantry, uh, uh, just the love of Jesus inside the school system, Davenport. Thank you for letting us do that. Thank you for guiding, directing us, uh, giving us the uh, feet and the arms and the, the strength to do this type of thing. We offer this service up to you, Lord, as a offering to you, be it our music and our time, uh, be it Pastor Roger as he uh, delivers a message, given the words of anyone here, the sound of our voices today, Lord, that don't know you, we would uh, lead them in a direction to the cross and out of love and, and show them the way and you could have your way with them. Maybe today would be the first day of the rest of their life knowing you as their personal savior. That is a goal. We have fun worshiping together, singing together, but there's one common goal that we have. We are in Christ, 
and everything we do should be in you. So as we think today, get our hearts and minds wrapped around that, that uh, you would use us to lead them to the cross and maybe uh, salvation would be laid on their heart to make that trip and give it all to you and accept you as our personal Savior. We give it all to you. We take none of it ourselves, Lord. Thank you for this appointed time where we could come together. Send praises to you. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hey, so... Uh, good morning. It's so good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we're going to sing just uh, three quick songs. Well, not I won't say quick, but three songs. And uh, the, the second of which, uh, if you want to follow along a little bit better, is on page, page three. Is that right? Page three in your hymnals. It's worthy of worship. It's not that hard of a song other than the fact that like the timing gets a little weird in spots and there's some dotted quarter notes. It's, it's probably very technical. You guys don't need to know all that. But if you want to follow along in your hymnals, it's on page three. Um, and so we're going to stand and sing and sing praises to our God because let me tell you, like, I don't know, like as each passing week goes by, I, I cherish our time together more and more because I know that the world just seems to be slip sliding away into, into craziness. Yet, our God is constant, and he loves us, and he proved his love for us at the cross. And so that's what we're singing about this morning. Those are some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, in our songs as we proclaim. And singing is not just singing to God. We're singing for each other and to each other the truths that we hold dear. And so if you would stand with us as we sing.
we do call out to you. You give us so many great things in this world and we put them way too high on a pedestal. You alone are the one that is worthy of praise. You came down as your son, Jesus Christ, to live a life that we couldn't. You took the beating that we couldn't handle. You hung on the cross and three days later, the stone rolled away and you walked out. That alone, Lord, is so unbelievably worthy of praise. And don't ever let us forget that. Father, our hope is in you. Our strength is within you. And on Sunday afternoons when we love to sit back and watch TV and think we have these idols that we love, you conquer all that. Father, just be with this worship service and this praise and with pastor as he gets ready to teach your word. Open our hearts, our minds, and just let the, your love overflow. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. If you will, take your Bibles and turn them to Romans chapter 11. We're turning to probably one of the most neglected chapters in the Bible. Romans chapter 11. It's, uh, a lot of times it's neglected because people don't quite understand it. And I'm not one that pretends to understand it all, but we're going to get the general uh, gist of it today. Romans chapter 11. This is going to be a two-part message. We're going to look at the first 22 uh, verses this morning and then the rest next week. We're talking about understanding unconditional election in the grand scheme of things. Okay, we've been talking about uh, election the past couple weeks from Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, and chapter 11. We're going to see how it fits in the Un, in the whole scheme of things. So let's all stand as we look at our passage this morning. It's 22 verses. You follow along in your Bibles. <clears throat> Hopefully you have those. If not, be on the screen in behind me. Beginning with verse 1, Paul says this. By the way, he concludes chapter 10 with God has dealt with the disobedient people of Israel. They rejected the gospel. And in verse 1 of chapter 11, it says this. I ask then, as God rejected his people... By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know that the scripture says, Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. If it is by grace it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect attained it. But the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that they would not see and ears they would not hear down to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will they and their inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches were broken off, And you, although a white olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who fall on, but God's kindness to you. Provide you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your holy word given to us for instruction in righteousness, for correction, for doctrine, for reproof. And Lord, I pray for these next few moments, you open our hearts and ears to your word. Guide us, give us clarity of thought. May Jesus, above all, be exalted. May we respond in a way that exalts him. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday, there were thousands of people gathered at the National Mall to pray for our nation. I think Franklin Graham summed it up, what he sent, the whole thing by, he said this, America is in trouble. If you scan the horizon, though, you will notice that it's not only America, but the whole world seems to be on fire right now. We as believers, though, are not totally surprised because we believe the Bible and know God's working to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. That's why Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourself together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see that day approaching. As we look at the world, we can see the scenarios taking place today. And in Romans chapter 11 we see how God is working among the nations in the grand scheme of things. That seems to be the idea. It's giving you the, the bird's eye view of what God is doing in the world. Paul is teaching the Romans about God's worldview, which is rooted in the nation of Israel and is working out in the nations of the world. You know, we say we're Christians, and I'm, a, I'm amazed that a lot of people profess Christ, and in this political year, there's a lot of people that are talking about Christianity, but it's kind of strange, a lot of people who say they're Christians don't seem to have a Christian worldview of things. They don't seem to understand the Bible that they profess to embrace. God has a worldview, and it's important that we understand His worldview. We need to understand the scheme of things to know what God's doing, the general direction the world is going, so we can join Him in His work in redeeming of mankind. Back in the New Testament times, the Jewish people uh, were the scorn of Gentiles, and they still are today, have been the scorn of Gentiles for centuries. They have been the target of anti-Semitic attacks, Jewish jokes, Jewish persecutions. And in the midst of this environment, picture yourself in Rome, these Roman Gentiles, of course, of course there were Jews there too, but these Roman Gentiles were asked to believe in a Jewish Savior. Think about that. They were asked to believe in a Jewish sailor, Savior. In the midst of this environment, most Jews refused to believe in the Jewish Savior themselves. And the Gentiles were asked to believe in a Jewish Savior that the Jews even rejected. And in chapter 9, we saw... Uh, the presentation of how God elects some to guarantee His glory. In chapter 10, we see the reason for unconditional election because uh, the Jews clearly rejected the gospel, but God saved people in spite of themselves. And in chapter 11, we see an evangelistic worldview that glorifies God's selecting mercy and salvation. It's also a warning for us to avoid anti-Semitic views, arrogance, and pride, overconfidence, which leads us to abandon the faith. You see, Romans 11 is about the way God has acted and will act toward Israel and toward the nations in history. It's important that we understand that so we're not on the wrong side of history, but we're the right side of the gospel. And we're not fighting against God, but we're working with God. Therefore, it's all about God and what He's like. And it says in Jeremiah 13, 11, God chose Israel, says, that they might be a people, a name, a praise, and a glory for God. See, God chose Israel uh, that they would bring Him glory. And it says in John, 7, or John 12, 27, when Christ came to earth, His goal was, he, before He was crucified, He said, Father, glorify Your name. It's all about the glorification of God. Ephesians 2, uh, 3.21 talks about the church, uh, to him be glory in the church. So you see, God's grand scheme of things is that he's going to be glorified. And that's why the, you know, the wheels are falling off the chariots all around the world today. You know, what we had confidence in is falling apart. Why? Because God is going to show that he's the one that deserves the glory. He will be glorified. You know, we thought we were so smart. We had uh, medicine all under control and all these uh, viruses that come along. You know, antibiotics, uh, you know, solves the, the bacteria things and viruses. We had it all figured out. And then look at what happened to the world. Something we haven't experienced in hundreds of years. Human pride is brought low. We realize that God is still on the throne. He's in charge. And in Romans 11, there's a spectacular uh, view of God's work in history. 
And it should cause us to be humble and admire him. But we live in such a strange world that's secular, self-centered, that, that uh, uh, this might make some of us angry as we look at this chapter, that we're not in charge of our destiny. Uh, we cannot save the world. God is in charge. And he will use who he will. He will save who he will when he wants to do it. In this two-part message, we will look at three of the six things that election in the grand scheme of things means. You know, we, we saw election. Then we see the reason for election is because men will not come to Christ in chapter 10. And now we're going to say what election means in the big picture of the worldview here. The first thing we notice is God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He keeps his word. Paul asked the radical question, I asked then, has God rejected his people? He just talked about how the Jewish people rejected the gospel. They nailed Christ to a cross. He came into his own, and his own received him not. And he asked the question, does this mean God has rejected? And the word there, rejected, means has God cast them away? In other words, is God done with them? Has God, is he done with the Jewish people? Is he fed up with them? Is he throwing them away? Then we see a relative answer. He says, by no means, Paul says, I myself am an Israelite. In other words, Paul is an example of God's grace. He says, has God rejected the Jews? Look at me. I, I was saved. The Lord saved me. And uh, that's proof he hasn't cast us aside. Paul was saved after the crucifixion of Christ, wasn't he? And so we find he was saved to be a, 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 a missionary to the Gentiles, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And the classification is God has not rejected the people whom he foreknew. See, the promise that God has made was not to the genetic Jewish person, the one who was born naturally, but the one who was born spiritually. It's not a physical birth, but it's a spiritual birth. And God elects some to believe. And others, he don't elect them not to believe. He just chooses to let them go their own way, which in a sense is God's judgment. Matter of fact, the prayer meeting in Washington, D.C. was about Americans have just gone their own way. You know, it's, it's not, you say, is God punishing us? Maybe God don't have to. He just needs to take his hand off us, and we will punish ourselves. You follow what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's, it's by God's mercy that we're, that we're still here today. You know, you go back to World War II and, and you my, battle Midway. You say, well, what was the difference? Uh, our mighty uh, military might won the war. No, the clouds opened up so a spotter plane could see their carriers before they saw ours. You know, God just goes, and he blows the clouds away so we could see them. And, of course, we won the battle Midway. And it goes on. That's how, you know, God works in human affairs. It's not about who we are, how, how great we are. It's about how great God is and his sovereign purpose. And we find uh, God has not rejected his people who foreknew. An example is this. He uses Elijah's example. Elijah got depressed when Jezebel and Ahab were after him. Because remember, he uh, brought the rain or he predicted the rain and, he, and fire came down from heaven and he killed all uh, Jezebel's prophets, or false prophets. And now Jezebel was trying to get even with him. And he was in a cave and he was hiding. He said, oh, only I remain. Lord, let me die. You know, I'm the only one holding the world up, his attitude. And the Lord reminded him that he had kept 7,000 men who had not bowed to Baal. Elijah thought he was the only one there, but actually there were thousands of them that had not bowed. There's a lot of believers out there today. Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones. But in the grand scheme of things in the world, there's people all over the world who have not bowed, who are serving God, who trusted Christ. Of all language groups, of all people, and all, you know, you'll find them in the Muslim countries, you'll find them in the dictatorship countries, you'll find them in the democracies, you'll find them all over the world, people who are genuine believers just like you, who we can sit down and hug one another and fellowship with. Amen? Yes. You know, we're not alone. We're not alone. Americans do not have uh, the, the, the center of the gospel. It's all over the world. Yeah, God saved people all over the world. And so the example is God reminds them that, that he's not rejected. Uh, just like Elijah had, there were 7,000. Then there's, there's even Jewish people across the world today who are saved by grace. Though the nation as a whole generally has rejected the gospel. There's a remnant chosen by grace, verse 5. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer by works. 
Those who are genuinely saved today are those who are not trying to work their way to heaven, but those who've come to Christ by faith in Jesus, saved by grace through faith. Jewish people we're talking about. You say, well, what's the result of the rejection? Verse 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect attained it. The rest were hard. Now, that's a, that's a tough verse here. It says, the result of the Jewish people rejecting the gospel, Israel failed in what it was seeking, uh, but the elect of Israel did seek it. So God guaranteed that some people will accept the gospel. Some of the Jews will accept the gospel. And he did that for the purpose of his glory. But it says the rest were hardened. Wow. What does it mean? God, in other words, some of the elect, of the, I mean all the elect of the Jewish people accepted the Lord. And the rest were hardened, it says. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes they would not see and ears they would not hear, down to this very day. Wow. You mean God hardens people so they won't come to Christ? I want us to notice this morning, those who failed God did not do so because they were hardened. They were hardened because they failed Him. Okay? In other words, the point is this. It's kind of like since they rejected the gospel, God hardened them to further His cause. They rejected the gospel. And so God is in the business of hardening those who have no willingness in themselves to come to him by the way that is mankind because we're not born by the will of the flesh by the will of man but we're born of God God has to do something to our heart and so what what this is saying here God uses sinful men to accomplish his purpose a good example of that would be the story of uh, Joseph and his and his brothers Uh, they sold him into slavery remember the story and in Genesis 50, when they meet up with him, <laughs> second in command of Egypt, uh, Joseph says to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You know, they, they meant to get rid of Joseph. You know, they would have killed him if they could have, but they, 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 they threw him away. I mean, they were hard-hearted, and, and God, God actually probably hardened them so they would actually sell uh, him into slavery because in the big picture, God said, in the future, I'm going to rise him up in Egypt to save the, my remnant out here. All the, the wisdom of God. Another example would be the crucifixion of Christ. You know, God planned the crucifixion of Christ. He used sinful men doing what he knew they would do. And he sent his son to earth knowing what they would do. They would kill him. And, but he, he knowing they would kill him, but in his death, it would pay for our sin. And so God is a step ahead of sinful man. God hardened Pharaoh's heart to accomplish his purpose. Now, Pharaoh already hardened his heart. Okay? And God just said, well, since you're hardened, I'm just going to use you for my glory. And that's what we need to understand. No matter who's in authority, God has put him there in the kingdoms of the world. Uh, believe it or not, God uh, put Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler in power, believe it or not. God put our presidents in power, believe it or not. God put all these people in power. You say, why? Because he's going to use them for his glory. It's all about the glory of God. That's what the Bible teaches. They're ordained of God. Isn't that right, Brother Bob? The authorities are ordained of God. We've heard that on Wednesday night. In other words, yeah, but he's not a Christian. doesn't matter. God can use a lost man as much as he can a Christian man for his glory anytime he wants to. Yeah. It was it Xerxes that, uh, who was it that, uh, that let the uh, people uh, go back and build the wall? I think it was, right? Nehemiah, before a heathen king and the heathen God used the heathen king and went back and built the walls in Nineveh, or Nineveh, in, in Nehemiah's day, built the walls of Jerusalem. Remember that? God can use whoever he wants to. And so, God is, in the grand scheme of things, his election, he's using men, he's hardening men to move and do what he wants them to do. And of all men, he's electing some to be saved for his own glory. Wow. The Bible says the king's heart is like the river. The Lord steers it which way it should go. 
I got thinking about that, about that one day. In Kern River, southern Missouri, we used to float down the river. You know, the king's heart is as the river. Man, the river, the river kind of goes the path of, path of least resistance. So what is, how does God steer the river? He puts a mountain in the way that the river can't overcome. And the river bounces off that bluff, the cliff, and, or the rock wall and goes this way. And it, goes left. it just follows and bounces off, you know, down through there. And the Lord steers the leader's hearts by putting pressure on them from different directions. So they accomplish his divine purpose. Isn't that great? God is still in control. This election coming up, I know who you like uh, to get elected, and you ought to vote, and you're accountable to God for how you vote. But whoever wins is who God has ordained. As one guy said, sometimes the Lord gives us better leaders than we deserve. Sometimes he gives us worse leaders than we think we deserve. And sometimes he just gives us what we deserve. But God is still in charge. But we see, number two, God is using Israel's rejection for the good. They rejected God. God hardened their heart to accomplish his purpose. And he used it for the good. And and what's that? Because the Jewish people rejected the gospel, we see God has a redemptive purpose in this. Look at verse 11. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? In other words, that they stumble in order that they might just be done away with. By no means, rather, through their trespass or through their stumbling. Remember, they stumbled over the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. So what happened is, Israel rejected God. And God says, okay, you know, I'm now going to offer salvation to the Gentiles. I'm going to start saving Gentiles. And I'm going to use that to make you jealous so the future, my elect will come back. And I'm going to save some as well. So everything God does is out of love, out of mercy. It's out of his glory. Amen. And, it's, and, and it's, it, it's, it's, he did it so to make Israel jealous for in the future because God's not through with his chosen people. His chosen people, his elect, he's going to save. He's going to save them. Not all Jews are going to be saved. Not all Gentiles. But those who God chooses, he's going to save. Because in the grand scheme of things, God is on the throne, not man. And it goes on to say, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And uh, now if the trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So Gentiles are included in the promise of salvation. Okay. And we find since the setting aside uh, of the Jewish people... Uh, when they come back in, it's going to be a blessing to the Gentiles as well. And when I'm thinking about that, you say, how would that be a blessing to the Gentiles? I was thinking of Revelation. Remember when God sets aside the 144,000 Jewish witnesses to go out into the world? You know, they're going to go out in the world and they're going to be preachers. Okay? And, and you think that's going to benefit the Gentiles? Yeah. Through the tribulation, even though God's going to turn back and deal with the Jewish people as a whole, as a nation, there will be thousands of people come to Christ during the great tribulation time. Or during the tribulation time. That's why I believe it teaches in Revelation. And so that's going to be a blessing. That's going to be a blessing. So Israel is kind of set aside now. God's dealing with the Gentiles in this church age, we call it, right? And then God's going to turn back and deal with his people one last period of earthly history in which they will be saved, the elect will be saved, and God will be glorified as he completes his time. So we find when we think of God setting aside the Jews and dealing with the Gentiles, uh, and, and you have the opportunity to be saved, it should be a reminder against arrogance. It should cause us to be humble. In verse 16, Paul says, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. In other words, the whole, holy means set aside. Don't mean you have moral value. It means you're set aside. Okay? And if the root is holy, the, all the branches are holy. So Israel was set aside, but it says some of the branches were broken off, and a wild olive shoot was grafted in. Who's that? That's the Gentiles. They were grafted in to the, the system. Okay? The system is uh, God's covenant with Abraham. And God's promise, through him all the nations of the world will be blessed. And through Abraham come the Messiah, through Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And so we as Gentiles were grafted in to that system, okay, 
where we have the opportunity now by faith to be saved. But you don't have the faith of yourself. It's a gift of God, the Bible says. But it's the opportunity. See, let's look at it this way. Some people live their whole life without ever hearing about Jesus. You believe that? Yeah. No opportunity. Some people, though, have lived their life with the opportunity of knowing who Christ is and how to be saved. That's the Jewish people at that time. But now it's the Gentile people as well. Okay. Would you say the opportunity in itself is a blessing? Yes. Just the opportunity. Okay. Just because you had the opportunity doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you're born in America where you have a church on every corner doesn't guarantee your salvation. There's something that takes place. The Bible says you're justified by faith. You might be grafted in, but if there's no fruit that comes by faith, grafted in, you've got to draw from the life. You follow what I'm saying? That comes by faith. And if you have no faith, that opportunity is broken off. The opportunity is broken off. It's kind of like if you respond to the light you have, Romans chapter 1, God gives you more light. And you will come to Christ eventually. That's God drawing you. But if you reject what happens in Romans chapter 1, you get darker. You get darker. You get broken off. And so we find here that God has reminded us not to be arrogant because the Jewish people, they were broken off. And so as Gentiles, we were given opportunity. But don't get arrogant. Exercise genuine faith as evidence of salvation. Now, being broken off does not mean you will lose your salvation. It means those who are broken off never had salvation. They never had life-giving faith, generally in Jesus Christ. The olive tree is saved Israel. The wild olive tree is the church. And, and Jesus talked about this, the parable of the wicked tenants. He talks about let the vineyard, uh, let it continue. Uh, but he says, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruits. The Jewish people had the vineyard, they had the, they had the tree, and, and, and Jesus said there was no fruit, so it was going to be taken away and given to people producing fruit. He's talking about the Gentiles here. Uh, so we find Israel is hardened, the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. Israel's rejection allows the Jew or the Gentiles to come into the kingdom. However, we should not be proud because God hardened the Jewish people who rejected their opportunity. And God will harden us and remove us if we don't genuinely plug into Jesus Christ. You see it all, all across America today. We've had people who were raised in church. People go to church. Listen, if you don't, if you don't trust Christ while you can, there's going to come a time where you can't trust Christ. You won't, you'll harden yourself. And then God's going to harden you. And use you for his glory in some other way than you come into Christ. So even in Israel there was a mixed multitude. But only a few were saved. And they were only saved because God elected them. Amen. You say, well preacher, how do you know if you're elect? If you believe and you stay faithful to the Lord, that shows that your election is sure. Amen. If you reject Christ, then it shows that you, your election wasn't genuine. You thought you were. And acted as though you were. So we see God's grand scheme of things is he has not rejected his people. And God is using Israel's rejection for the good. By He rejected them so God has turned to the Gentiles for the past 2,000 years. And has been filling the kingdom with people of all ethnic, of all nations for his glory. And he's not filling it with all Gentiles, but elect Gentiles, those who he just by sovereignly chooses. And there's, there's, there's millions of them, okay? But we don't know who they are. But it's God doing the work. That's what he's doing in the world today. So God will do whatever he does in America and whatever he does in China, maybe to bring salvation to somebody in Ukarumpa. Maybe to bring salvation to somebody in Antarctica. Maybe somebody in Chile or Peru or Bangladesh. 
Maybe he's, he's using all this and orchestrating it all to save people. That way in heaven there's trophies from every people group that's ever existed in the world. And among those people group, of course, there's the Jews, his beloved. Amen? But that's what God's doing today. It's all about bringing his elect to salvation. So will God allow a nation to fail and fall? Yeah. Will God allow a dictator to rise in some places? Yeah. Will God allow tragedies? Yeah. Because in the grand scheme of things, God's about saving his elect, and he's going to come back and take it all over. That's what it's all about. So the third point I want to notice this morning I know, you know, we could talk for months on this chapter, you know, that there's so much here. And, you know, get into it, explain it. It might sound a little confusing to you, but I'm trying to give you the gist here. Gentiles, understanding election in the grand scheme of things means that Gentiles should not take mercy for granted. Gentiles must stand fast through faith with fear or reverence toward God. And it says in verse 19, as we kind of wrap it up this morning, you, well, I'm not wrapping it up real quickly, but it says, branches were broken off so that I might uh, be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. You stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, talking about the Jewish people, neither will he spare you. You're the wild olive tree people. Okay? Note then the kindness and severity of God. Wow. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provide, providing you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. You say, how does this reconcile with eternal security? You, you know, we as Baptists believe once saved, always saved, right? However, that's not a biblical term. We as Baptists believe in eternal security. It's called the perseverance of the saints. In other words, those who are genuine, we believe those who are genuinely saved will persevere. God who began a work in you will continue it. If you're his elect, it will be evident you're his elect by you coming to faith in Christ and by you staying faithful to Christ and persevering until death. That's evidence that you're the elect. That's evidence you've been saved. That's persevering, right? That's not to say we don't fall, fall uh, all the time, we, but we get back up. The person who made a profession of faith and hadn't been back in 30 years, that's not good evidence for being elect of God. What do you think? That's not good evidence that he began a good work in somebody and it's continuing today. Now, I know there's different things people don't understand, and I understand they're different environment, but, but we as Baptists, we believe that if God saves you, you're elect, and you're saved for eternity, the evidence that you're one of the elect is you persevere in your life. Now you say, what does that do? You who are saved, that stirs you to want to persevere. That stirs you to prove the point. That stirs you to live right to prove that you are one of God's. Because you believe it. Which means you are too. Okay, for those who are not the elect, they could care less about what we're talking about. They don't want to do that. But, and that's why Paul, you say, how does this reconcile with, with our belief in uh, persevering of the saints? Uh, it, it talks about you will, if you continue in the faith, it, it's an if there. You know, you, you will be grafted in, you will stay faith. If you continue in faith, you won't be cut off. That's a threat almost. But the fact is, it's actually twofold. It's for a mixed multitude. Those who have ears to hear will hear. And they will persevere because they believe the truth and they want to show that they are a genuine believer and demonstrate to God and know they're accountable to God. Say if you're saved, you know you're accountable to God and you want to do right. What do you all think? You're not trying to get away with something. And, and so the whole picture is uh, we're to stand fast through faith. And uh, and the Gentile, danger of the Gentiles is God will cut them off. The danger is you have the opportunity, but if you don't attach by faith, I believe at the judgment, you will be cut off. Now, cut off from your profession or your outward attachment. 
not your inward faith. Because if it's inward, if it's real, you won't be cut off. You with me now? But if your faith is not real, say you attached yourself, you're a Jew, you attached yourself, you raised a Jew, you went through all the rituals, you do everything in your heart, you don't believe. You're part of the, the, you're part of the olive tree as a branch, but yet you're not, there's no life in you. So it's just outward appearance. There's a lot of people who profess Christ that have outward appearance, but in their heart, they're not really attached to Christ. They come to church. They might even read their Bible. They might go to Sunday school. They might say all the right things, sing all the right hymns, but, but there's no real fruit in their life because in their heart, they're not drawing from the eternal life of Jesus Christ by faith. They're not justified by faith. It's not genuine faith, okay? Deep down inside, they're trusting the fact that they were born in America. They were born in a Baptist home. Their dad was a preacher. Their dad was a deacon or what? Grandma prayed for me. They're trusting in all the, or I've never done anything real wrong. I went to church all my life. You know, their, their faith is in that. They've done many wonderful works, but at the judgment, they will say, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works? And the Lord said, depart from me, for I never knew you. That's called being cut off. Amen? That's called being cut off. And that's the warning to us. And, and not only that, folks, but in, in other words, we as believers who have been grafted in to the promises of Abraham, like a wild olive tree, and being grafted into the opportunity, and God has given us the gift of faith, and we believe, so now we're tapped into the life of God through faith, right? The Holy Spirit lives in us. Okay, the sap, I guess you could say, right? It produces the fruit. We're, we're tapped into that. We don't go around looking down on the Jews who got cut off and say, ha, look at you, you know. You know, a lot of anti-Semitic, you know, we, we make fun of the Jews because they're blind to the gospel. We treat them as, you know, you've heard Jew jokes all your life, haven't you, huh? You know, when I was a kid, we used to do a lot of Polish jokes. Remember those? And you know what Polish jokes come from? In World War II, Poland was overrun by both the Russians and the Germans. And people said, oh, they couldn't defend themselves. They kind of made fun of them. And it's this real sad thing. Poland, they fought, but yet in World War II, they ended up with, you know, being dominated by the communists for decades. You know, they really got the bat end of the stick there. And here, as a grade school kid, I remember we were laughing at Poles, Polish people. I didn't know why I was laughing. I was just that thing to do, laugh at people. You guys know what I'm talking about? You know, I mean, we, we, may, we talk about us, but that's an arrogance. People, people uh, you know, Jews or, or whatever, we should not be so arrogant. We need to believe that if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. You know, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd be overrun like Poland was in World War II. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you know, I could have been born in a Jewish family that reject Christ completely. You know, so we need to realize that our boasting we should not boast. And that's the warning here because God will cut you off too because boasting and pride is evidence that you're not elected. Why is it? Because what produces boasting and pride? Self-vindicating righteousness works. So if your salvation is dependent upon your works and something you've done, you can boast about that and look down on others. But if genuinely in your heart you're resting in faith in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to boast about. You walk humbly with God. So that's why Paul is saying if you boast, you'll be cut off. Boast is evidence that something is wrong in your spiritual heart. God is at work in the grand scheme of things. He's showing mercy. And he's warned us all that baptism, communion taking, worship at the tithes, giving, uh, a doctrinal affirming church, all these things does not make you a child of God. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Okay? The Gentiles have been grafted in, which means the Gentiles now can hear the message. As one guy said one time, it's everybody's maybe right to hear the message once, but should you be so privileged as to hear it twice? The fact is you have the opportunity 
And even given, and God is showing that even given, okay, He's showing it to the Jews. Even though they were His covenant people, what did they do? They rejected God. The Gentiles, He's showing that even though Gentiles have the opportunity to be saved, they won't come. God has to elect some for them to come because men are sinners by nature and choice. And God is glorified, His mercy is glorified when He saves people. Amen. That's why it says, examine yourself, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. The Bible tells us to examine ourselves. So what you do, you get before God, the Holy Spirit, amen? You take the Word of God, and you let God speak to your heart. And if your experience and your faith lines up to what the Bible describes, then it's not something you did, which you will know that because you're using the Bible, but you will have peace with God because you line, you've examined yourself and you line up to what God says. Amen? And what does that give you? It gives you peace, gives you comfort, gives you excitement, and it causes you to give God the glory because God done that for you. So, as we look at this, in other words, all of redemptive history, as we conclude here, is designed from beginning to end to put a stop to human boasting in Jewishness or non-Jewishness, Gentile or non-Gentile. Free and sovereign grace stops boasting and leads to humble, broken-hearted gratitude and worship. That's why 1136, we'll talk about next week, says... From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. So, in a nutshell, what is God doing in the world today? God is orchestrating things. He's working, dealing with the Gentiles to bring a certain number into his kingdom. Amen? Then he's going to turn back and he's going to deal with the Jewish nation to bring a certain number into his kingdom there's a time when all Israel will be saved when Christ comes and God will be glorified. He's used one against the other to save people of all nations. So when God shows off his trophies of grace, he will show some that these come out of my elect Jewish people. Oh, these trophies here, these, these came out of the Gentiles because... These Jewish people refused. I turned to the Gentiles and saved them in spite of them. And God is glorified with people of all nations accepting him. What does that do for us? It should humble us. It should cause us not to, uh, to be, uh, be anti-Semitic. Amen? It should cause us to realize that, you know, God is, is at work in the world saving people. That's the worldview. That's salvation's worldview. It's not about men. It's about what God is doing. So what's that invitation for us as believers? As believers, the invitation for us is just to join where God's working. Amen? Amen. Join. He, we don't create the wave. God creates the wave. We ride the wave, right? We ride the wave. And so we join him where he's working. And we're grateful for what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would take this message and help us to understand, Lord, that you are working the world sovereignly, saving people in spite of themselves. People who would know who wouldn't come to you unless you did a work in their life. You're saving people of Gentiles, of Jews. Right now you're dealing with Gentiles, and someday you'll turn back and deal with the Jewish nation again, and multitudes of them will come to you. Father, help us to see what you're doing, to praise you for it, and to join you in it. In Jesus' name, amen.